Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome back to the Systems and Sustainability Echo. My name is Andrea Roche. I'll be facilitating our conversation today. I just have a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Just so you know, this session is enabled for live closed captioning. If you want to view that to help with your experience, please just navigate to the bottom of your Zoom window and select that show captions option. It might be hidden under that um, three menu, or excuse me, that, that three dot more menu on the bottom right corner of Zoom. Um, if you're having any trouble accessing that or your audio isn't sounding good, chat directly with UT Echo IT and Carly will help you out. As you saw at the beginning, we're recording these sessions and we'll make them um, available later through our YouTube channel. Know that any information you put in the chat does not make it over onto those recordings. As always with our sessions, please stay muted unless you're speaking, but we do encourage everyone to speak and share their, share their feedback today. If you've joined by computer, um, you're just gonna select that mute icon on the lower left of your Zoom controls. And if you're on the phone, press star six and wait for that very loud voice to tell you you're unmuted. Um, we do encourage everyone to join by video, especially for the discussion portion, because you can see the really beautiful Hollywood squares effect if we all have our videos on. That said, I recognize that we don't always want our videos on all the time or your, your bandwidth may not allow it. So we're happy you're here regardless of how you've joined. Um, we do appreciate you helping us with a record of attendance. Navigate to your chat window and enter your name, um, email and affiliation over in the chat. And know that if you're a Texas, um, Be Well Texas provider and you're joining by phone, we really wanna make sure you get credit for attending today's session. So email your phone number to the Be Well Texas team at bewelltx at uthscsa.edu. We'll throw that information over in the chat as well. Um, if there are a lot of con comments today or content happening today, and you do wanna speak up, feel free to use the reactions menu in Zoom. You can get to that in the lower right corner of your Zoom window. Um, you can also share information in the chat, raise questions, share your own challenges, share your own solutions. And just remember whether you're speaking up or contributing in the chat, no PHI is allowed in either space at any time during the session. Keep an eye on the chat. We will um, we'll send out a link to a post-session evaluation survey towards the end of the session, so fill it in, and you'll be entered in a drawing to win a Walmart gift card to the tune of $30. All right, I'm very excited for our session today. We are gonna have a didactic from Dr. Aaron Finley about adapting evidence-based practices to fit your setting. I think this is gonna be a really helpful didactic in helping us address what comes after that, our case presentation from Daisy. Um, so as, as always, I encourage all of you to share your questions, share your feedback, share your guidance um, throughout this session. When we all teach, we all learn. So we're gonna get started with some introductions. I'm gonna to go to you first, Leslie. Thank you. Greetings, everybody. I'm Dr. Leslie Manson. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, a clinical associate professor at ASU. Um, I'm also an international consultant for integrated care implementation, auditing, and sustainability. And I have about 20 years of clinical experience working in primary care, substance use, peer services, and behavioral health. So I really look forward to being part of this team. I've really enjoyed it. And I really hope that you all participate today as part of our community and helping um, with our case discussions. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Leslie. Matt. Hi, folks. Good to be with you. My name is Matt Rosa. Backgrounds in uh, clinical social work, direct practice in substance use and mental health, uh, agency administration, governmental planning. I work now full time as a consultant, mostly in the areas of implementation science, quality improvement, process improvement, um, NITEX uh, trainer, and uh, evidence-based practice implementation. So glad to be here. Thank you. B. Hello, everyone. Briseida or B. Kotwa. And I am the Substance Use Treatment Care Director with Be Well Texas. Um, I've been in the field of set services, uh, providing direct care, creating programs, uh, working with teams, I would say for the past 30 years. And um, happy to be here. We're glad you're here, B. Kathy. Hello, everyone. I'm Kathy Hudgens. Um, I am a licensed professional counselor, and my PhD is in marriage and family therapy. Um, I'm a consultant. I help build systems for mental health, co-occurring disorders, substance use treatment, um, and I also work on the health policy level. 
been doing integrated care for about 20 years, have been in all types of practice um, that, um, across the continuum, and delighted to be here with you all. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Andrea. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrea Hubler, and I am the program coordinator for CSTAD and for the ECHO series. Happy to be here. Thank you. Daisy. Good morning or good afternoon, actually. Um, so I'm Daisy Ramirez, um, LCDC, uh, and I coordinate the program uh, Project ROAD, which stands for Recovery from Opiate Addiction and Dependence. Thanks so much for joining us to, to provide our case for today, Daisy. And then last, I'll go to you, Erin, if you could provide an introduction and then take it away with your slides. Sure. Hi, I'm Erin Finley. I'm a medical anthropologist by training and health services researcher and implementation scientist by profession. Um, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and Psychiatry here at UT Health. But my primary affiliation actually is with the uh, VA Greater Los Angeles, where I'm an investigator with the uh, Center for the Study of Health and Implementation Innovation and Policy. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. I've been working with this group for a long time in other capacities, but I haven't gotten the opportunity to see the work that's done here. So it's just really a, a treat to be here. So thank you so much for having me. Now, do you want me to dive in or should we pause? No, that's great. Take it away. All right, we'll take it away and I'll talk for a little bit, but hopefully not too long because we have lots of other things to talk about. I'm going to share my slides. So we're going to talk a little bit about adaptation and, and how we take evidence-based practices and make them work better for us and be more effective in our environments. Um, I will say, I can't see the chat as we're going through, so Andrea, please speak up if there's anything that I should stop and address. That would be super helpful to my mind. And of course, I have no financial conflicts to disclose all opinions. As a federal employee, I have to note all opinions are only my own and no one else's. But I would like to acknowledge that a lot of what I have to say is kind of contextualized in the work we do out of the, the REACH Center at UT Health San Antonio, as well as the VA and the, the, the many initiatives and trials we have going through there. So today we really wanted to talk about a couple of things. First of all, understanding how beneficial it can be to conduct a thoughtful adaptation of evidence-based practices to make them work better for us. Um, typically around improving their acceptability and feasibility and compatibility for our settings. I wanted to walk through a couple of the many existing models for step-by-step -step adaptation. I think these models can be really helpful to us because they can give us a structure for taking feedback and moving forward with it. But there are many of them, so we'll walk through a couple examples with those. And we're just thinking about how tracking and evaluating adaptations can actually be a really part of uh, important part of continuous improvement as we engage as learning health organizations across all the work that we do. So when we're talking about evidence-based practices, um, I usually think of them in the broadest possible sense, so kind of the seven Ps. So they can be programs, they can be practices. Um, I originally started out more in the behavioral health realm, so it was with psychotherapy. Um, but procedures, principles, uh, medication guidelines, medications themselves, policies, products, many, many things. We're speaking about evidence-based practices writ broadly. And one of the things that has been so interesting to watch the last few years particularly is a growing emphasis on, and not just in implementation, but also in intervention design, a growing emphasis on adaptive and participatory approaches. There has been more and more evidence to point to the fact that if you just take an evidence-based practice and drop it into a new setting or a new population, it may work, but often it's gonna need some tweaking to really fit well and be as effective. So we're seeing a lot more emphasis on human-centered design approaches, user-centered design approaches, co-learning approaches, working with our partners to be really participatory and community engaged because we find that it makes our work better. And also, even on the even in the level of intervention design and testing, we're seeing a lot more reliance on these kind of small scale iterative pilots rather than the grand RCT. And that's been really interesting to watch. And I think I think the lessons around adaptation really really have fed into. 
So why do we want to focus on adaptation? So one of the wonderful things about how we do science now is when we're looking to implement a new practice or a new treatment, or even just to think about we have a problem, we have a gap in our care system, how would we like to go about addressing that? We have more and more a very strong evidence base of EVPs that can help us to do that. And we can look at the evidence and we can say, you know, here's our problem, here's our gap, here's an intervention or a policy or a principle that's going to help us to address that gap. But even so, we find that often, not always, but often we do need to adapt that EVP to some extent in order to make it fit better for a new population, a new setting, or to be delivered by a new set of providers. Um, and again, as I noted earlier, this can really be helpful in proving the acceptability of the EVP. For example, it, is it acceptable to patients? Is it acceptable to providers? Is there real buy-in in the setting, as in, we want this badly enough to go to some trouble to make it happen because implementation is not effortless. Um, how feasible is it to implement? Is this something that's going to work with our existing clinic structure? Is this something where we have to uh, create new clinic stop codes in order to do the billing? Do we have to change how long our sessions are? Is this going to work for us? And then thinking about compatibility too. How compatible is this EVP with our existing behaviors, our existing patterns and workflows. And one of the things we know is that a lot of times when you take an evidence-based intervention and you move it into a new setting, we see a drop in the effectiveness of the intervention. We call that voltage drop. When we have effective adaptation, we can reduce the voltage drop so that we maintain and even can improve the effectiveness of the intervention. But it has to be done thoughtfully. And there's there's a wonderful paper that I love that talks about acting both scientifically and pragmatically. And we need to be able to do both at the same time. So when we're talking about adaptation, what are we talking about? Well, we're just thinking about really intentional modifications of an EVP with the goal of achieving a better fit between the intervention and a new context. Um, these can be planned. You know, when you're looking at an EVP, you're thinking about putting this into a new setting. Um, and you're saying, ah, okay, I can see ahead of time based on all of our experience, based on all of the data, we're going to need to make these tweaks versus a responsive adaptation where maybe we go in, we try something, we see mm, there's a problem coming up, we need to make some modifications here to make this work effectively. Also, I love the fact, and I'll come back to this, this guidance, the ADAPT guidance here that I'm citing. Um, I love the fact that they really know this is likely to be ongoing because context is always changing over time. So adaptation is not necessarily something we're gonna do just once. It's, it's more of a mindset to being attentive to, is this something we need to continue to do over time? So what would be some examples of the kinds of adaptations we need to think about? And there are many, 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 but here are just two. So one would be, Say we have an intervention that was developed by researchers as an evidence-based smoking cessation intervention, but it's only ever been delivered by researchers. Okay, now it's time to take it out of the real world. And in this case, this, um, this team wanted to uh, enable healthcare managers to deliver the intervention instead. So this was really about adapting for new innovation deliverers. Another example would be say, taking an existing intervention like the step away mobile intervention system, and then adapting it for a new population. So in this case, adapting it to work better for veterans with a positive screen for others drinking. And that would be adapting for a new population. So that would, those are both the examples of the kinds of adaptation we can talk about. But it could also be to the content of the intervention. It could be um, cultural tailoring or cultural adaptation to make it a better fit for the population. It could be, again, new deliverers. It could be changes in the format. Um, one, of the, one of the studies we have going now in the VA is offering a perinatal mental health intervention for women veterans during their pregnancy to reduce postpartum depression. And we're implement, we're, we have a set of sites where we are formally implementing and we have a set of sites where they're kind of taking the intervention and doing their own thing. And it's just fascinating to see all of the different ways that people are trying to adapt the intervention without changing the core components. And we are learning a lot from seeing how people are taking this up naturally and making it work better in their environment and for their populations. 
one of the real challenges in adaptation, and one of the reasons it's so helpful to have some of these structured pathways for doing that adaptation, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, is the challenge really of balancing the fidelity to the intervention as it was tested and shown to be efficacious. So we have evidence, we know this intervention works. So we don't want to stray too far from that, or at least from the core components of the intervention, because then we might lose the effectiveness of the intervention. On the other hand, if we don't adapt some to suit our new environment or our new population, we may be decreasing the chance that this is going to be an appropriate intervention for that setting of population. So really, when we're going out to conduct adaptation, we're trying to do so in a way that really balancing you know, the need to maintain fidelity and the need to achieve beautiful compatibility instead. And that gets back to that, that point earlier about balancing um, acting scientifically and pragmatically at the same time. So let me walk just for a few minutes through some of these models for step-by-step -step adaptation. So I went through them a little bit in, in, in when they were first proposed. So this one was first proposed in 2008. It came out of Emory and some of the work that they were doing on HIV and interventions. And they laid out a process for saying, okay, what is our, what is our group of folks who are at risk? Why are they at risk? What is the EBP that we need to uh, that seems to show best evidence for meeting this need? Looking at the EBP and saying, okay, what adaptations need to be made? How do we need to make them? Thinking about how do we go about drafting and then documenting those adaptations? So we made X adaptations to the, say, the treatment, menu, for example. And this is why we made those adaptations. So they focus on the documentation, really noting what was done. Pulling in topical experts, who can help with this? Who can help us do a better job with this? Integrating, okay, we've gotten all this feedback. How do we take that and move that into a practical application? It needs to be trained in order to deliver this intervention as it has now been adapted. And then testing, looking at it, doing evaluation, saying, did this enhance the outcomes or did it not? And if it didn't, maybe we need to start back towards the beginning a little bit again and re rethink some of the choices that we made. So this was one of the original kind of outlines for structured adaptation that was put forward. And it, it holds up, maybe people still use this regularly. Another model that's been put forward, um, I like because it's a little bit different and I think they all have their uses. So this is the program for, uh, the method for program adaptation through community engagement. And this one, there's a focus on starting with an adaptation steering committee. So really saying from the beginning, we know we're going to need perspectives from a lot of different kinds of folks in order to really make this adaptation as successful as it should be. Then they propose, and I think this is interesting, they propose that we implement the unadapted program in order to generate recommendations for program change. So not we're going to go ahead front end and make changes we think need to be made. But let's try it first. Maybe there are going to be things that we don't think work that actually work really well. Um, maybe there are going to be things we're convinced work that actually don't work. Because sometimes you just don't know to try. So they put in that, which I think is very interesting. They then, after you've implemented the unadapted program, they do a systematic evaluation of each of the program components. They summarize that feedback. And then they, they walk through that feedback to say, ah, OK. This is where we need to make program modifications for our setting. So it's, it's a streamlined process, but it's very thoughtful. And this, this can be very helpful as well as a, as a process to go to. And again, I, I, I certainly will make the slides available. And we have the citations on each of these slides if any of these approaches are interesting or useful for your, for your purposes. The most recent guidance that has come out, and this is a great article in the BMJ from 2021. And I'm sorry, this is a little small, depending on how big screen is. Um, but what I think is great about this is, A, they kind of walk through where do we need adaptations and where do we maybe need a whole new intervention? Because there can be a time where if you're having to add, adapt something too significantly, maybe it's not the right EVP for your purposes. Um, but they also start, which I think is really important, with an adaptation team comprised of diverse partners with a lot of different perspectives on the problem. They're also starting by looking at the rationale for the intervention and considering how to make it work more effectively for the context. They're also looking for 
plane for the adaptations. Ah, okay, these are the adaptations we we're going to test and try. Um, they're then using the adaptations, implementing and piloting, evaluating as they go. And then having, having that information, that data from the evaluation, they're implementing and, and making some decisions about how they want to implement this long term and ultimately how they want to scale and spread. Um, so this is another really nice, this is intended to be more of a summative approach where they really reviewed the literature on how people were doing adaptation and tried to take out the key step. Um, but this is another really nice resource for thinking about structured approaches to adaptation. One of the things that I think really stands out in all of these models is this idea that we need to track and evaluate adaptations and that this can be a really powerful tool in continuous improvement. I will notice though, when I do consultation work and when we work with a variety of different partners, a lot of folks here kind of, oh, we have to track it and evaluate it and they can be a little bit intimidated, but it doesn't have to be very complex. It can be as simple as something like plan, do, study, act cycles. So I wanted to walk through a, a simple example here because Again, it, it's really about the learning. It's, it's not necessarily about the complexity. So I thought this was a great graphic because I love how it illustrates that often we are working in a moving target. We are trying to implement something. We are trying to improve something. We are trying to improve our care system. And we do so in many iterative, iterative small steps over time. So we may achieve one small change, which leads to another small change, which leads to another small change. And that can fit really beautifully into our paradigm for continuous improvement in all of our work. So just a quick example, and I will say I do have some resources I think I mentioned listed on one of the later slides for some of these kind of tools. But so AHRQ has a very nice PSA tool for quality improvement in healthcare. Um, so here would just be a simple example. So say we have an EBP, want, we want to implement a new screen over alcohol use in our setting. And the adaptation is, it has usually been delivered by the nurse, but we're going to adapt it to see if we can have the patient complete the screener on their own in the waiting room. And the plan is, okay, we're going to test this. We're going to see if we can get 20 patients to complete the screener in the first week. So in PDSA cycles, you're always identifying a very small, smart goal that you can say, okay, this work is to be. And the idea is this is gonna happen because front desk staff are gonna provide and collect the screener as part of the check-in process, and they're gonna hand it off to the nurse for entry into the patient record. Simple, right? So if we go ahead and do this, we try this. And what we find is, okay, of course, patients sometimes arrive late and don't have time to complete the screener before going into their appointment, that's fine. We also find that nurses are often running around and they may not have time to enter the screener data before the patient reaches the provider. So they're getting it entered, but they're not getting it entered in a way that the screener can be used as part of the appointment. Okay, good to know. So in the study, for, we see 18 patients completed the screener. So almost everybody was completing the screener. The front desk staff were, were able to get the screener to patients. So that was the first step. That was great. Um, but the screener information was only actually available to the provider for eight people. Okay, there's a gap. That's not going to work, right? So this didn't work well in terms of getting the results to the provider. So the next step in this case would be exploring the feasibility of the direct patient entry of the data of the tablets in the room. And of course, and that's gonna work in some settings, it's not gonna work in other settings. So this would all have to be very much complex dependent, but this is an example of how simple this can be. This does not have to be very complicated to be profoundly useful. So just kind of stepping back a little bit and thinking about, you know, looking across all these models for adaptation, what do we see are kind of the critical components? What we're really thinking about is looking at the EBP we're considering, and again, we're always choosing the EBPs about trying to reduce a gap or improve our services in a specific way. So the first step is really to think about, is this likely to work well as it is? Is it worth trialing it as it is to see where it does and does not work? Because our assumptions about what's going to work don't always hold. Um, and then thinking about whether it could benefit from adaptations to the format, to the messaging, to the education materials, to the length, to by whom it's delivered. Inviting input from a variety of those who are involved in delivery of care or impacted by delivery of the EDP. So this could be patients, families, staff, many, many people plan the targeted adaptations, and then implementing those and conducting small tests of change, 
seeing what works, refining as needed, and then really considering over time whether additional adaptations are needed. So if we break down the whole idea of adaptation into a few simple steps, this is really what we're doing. And I think I want to leave it there for now so we have lots of time for discussion, but these were some great resources that were available. Um, the SAMHSA toolkit on adapting evidence-based practice was really nice. I hadn't been aware of that, so I was really excited to find that one. Um, the Making Adaptations Tip Sheet from uh, DHHS was great. I love a tip sheet, they're very short and clear. And then there was also a really nice template for modifying MVPs to increase cultural competence. Um, there's a lot of materials on that. This one was relatively recent and, and pulled in a lot of great information. So those are all things that might be useful, hopefully. And thank you so much for having me. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Erin. That was terrific. Perfectly on time, too, I should say. Um, well, let's open it up to the community. Erin, um, you can go on and stop. Thank you. Stop screen share. Any questions um, based on that presentation? It strikes me, Erin, if you're working with an implementation team, they they might be hesitant to identify a framework at the beginning. It sounds like a little bit of added work just to plan something and strategize and everybody get on the same page about how we're gonna interact and move towards change. Do you have any guidance on how to sort of, how to assemble that team, how to choose that framework, how to get that early buy-in um, that seems really important when you're, when you're embarking on one of these adventures? Oh, that's such a good question. You know, and I think I think my answer would be really that it it's it depends, which is not very useful. But I think it's one of those situations where if you have a pretty good level of buy-in, everybody's kind of willing to give this a shot and nobody is expressing deep concerns about whether or not it's going to work or how it's going to work on the front end, it may be just worth giving it a try as is and then saying, you know, we're going to do this for a month for a set period of time or a set number of patients. Um, and then we're gonna revisit it as a group. And I think what's gonna come out of that is folks are going to have thoughts. They're either gonna think it was working or they're gonna have identified places where we tried it and it really wasn't working or it wasn't a good fit or we tried it with patients and they looked at us like we were nuts. Um, so at that point, you're gonna have a lot more information and you can decide, ah, we need to break this down. We need to think about solving these three problems. And then you can choose an approach that's going to fit where you are. So I think it's fine to take it step by step and try it as it is before thinking about adaptation. Um, I, I do think the benefit of that approach is, um, I think it's easier to say to people, we really need your help in making this better once they've argued for at why it's not working, right? So it, it's much easier to get buy-in when they've already pointed out the problem. So I think it can be quite natural and organic. We, we often talk about these things as structured, but they can, they can come about in a very organic way, and often that works the best. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Yeah, Shreya. Yes, hi, Erin. Thank you so much for the presentation. So uh, when we are adapting uh, interventions in different sites, how do we measure, like how do we assess the context? Like we know it's different, but then how do you quantify it? Or how do you kind of uh, have some sort of an objective assessment? That is such a good and complicated question. Um, so I'll give my answer and then other folks are welcome to, to pipe up with theirs. Um, I think the trick is, I don't think we can be entirely objective about it. We haven't, so certainly when implementation science was a little bit younger, there was a lot of focus on assessing implementation climate and context in quantitative ways before we got started. Those measures didn't turn out to work that well in terms of actually predicting how implementation was going to go over time. They just haven't been very successful in doing it. So what often works well, and you can do this in a small scale way, or you can do this in a very structured formal way, is a more qualitative assessment of at the local level, where do you think things are going really well for your organization? Where are you running into challenges? When you look at this intervention, you can even, there's a, a method for pre-mortems, which I think is great. 
But having people just look at the intervention and say, okay, where is this going to fall on its face? Or where is this going to actually be okay? And you can get a lot of information that way. Um, I think that some of the theoretical frameworks, even something like the updated CFER, can be really simple in just helping it kind of nail people down to, let's talk about what's going on inside the clinic that's going to be impactful here. Let's talk about what's going on outside the clinic that might have a, a, an impact here. For example, the local policy and how billing is going to work for this particular intervention. That can be really important. So even just being able to break down to some of these key domains or kinds of the kinds of things that are going to be helpful or, or get in the way of doing this implementation. Um, and then really always, always the people involved are the real magic um, and also can be the real challenge. So understanding sort of in a given setting, what's folks training, what's folks perspective on a problem, where do they feel confident in their work, where do they really wish they had more options to offer or had more supports and understanding those factors about a, a, a given context or, or probably going to be your best place to start for a lot of this kind of practical real world adaptation. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Great question. Thank you, Shreya. Well, let's move on with some announcements from um, the CSET program. I will say this didactic is really tied with a lot of themes you'll hear today in our case presentation. So Aaron, we may be coming back to you with some more questions about, about those frameworks. All right, so the Center for Substance Use Training and Telementoring provides high quality education in best practices for responding to substance use. CSAT, which is um, what that stands for, can help enhance a professional's knowledge and self-efficacy to screen, treat, and make referrals for people with substance use disorders. So learn more about this initiative at c-stat.utesca.edu. Uh, um, we'll throw that link over in the chat in just a moment. Next slide. We want to make sure you get your CE credits for attending today. So to claim your CME, you must text this number by midnight. Text ATTEND to 844-502-1338. We are going to put this information over in the chat. That code, that ATTEND code works better when you do not put any spaces in it. And make sure you text that by midnight tonight to get your CE credits. Next slide. So you should have received a, an email from the Zoom client for these sessions that um, alerts you to the continuation of this series. And, and also you should have had another email from Be Well Texas letting you know that this series has been updated. So make sure if you had any trouble getting to today's session, make sure you find that renewal email in your, in your email and download the new calendar invite um, so that this series is added onto your calendar moving forward. Thanks. Based on how many people came here, I don't think many people had many difficulties with it, but just make sure you know that we're here each month um, moving forward. Speaking of, we hope you'll join us next month to hear from Denise Beagley um, with Barner University Health Plans, um, talking about incorporating motivational interviewing strategies for staff coaching and supervision. So that'll be June 22nd, um, same time, same place. Next slide. We also want to let you know about an upcoming conference, the Neonatal Abstinence Syndrome Symposium. Um, the theme of it is connecting families and communities using culturally congruent approaches. So we'll throw the registration button or the registration link over into the chat. Really encourage you to check out this, this upcoming conference. And that's all I have. Thank you, Carly. So we're gonna move on to our case presentation for today. Um, Daisy, you're here to share with us um, work that you've been doing in a care context and some challenges and open up for the group, some, some questions and some opportunity to give some feedback here. So when you're ready, tell us more about the situation and how this, this group of learners can help. Thank you, appreciate uh, the time here. Um, so like I mentioned, I'm an LCDC and I uh, coordinate the program um, ROAD, uh, which stands for Recovery from Opiate and Addiction and Dependence. Um, we are an FQHC uh, clinic, and therefore uh, we offer multiple services. Um, our program specifically, though, is for anybody over the age of 18 that has been actively using opiates for the last 30 days. Um, our team consists of two LCDCs, which one of them is a, is a case manager, a recovery coach, an LVN, and one doctor. Um, because we are a clinic setting, um, I think at times we may not be able to provide 
the full support uh, for our clients as they come in. Um, for example, if somebody comes in under the influence or uh, they've relapsed or they're just going through certain situations, um, as they come in, they check in and then all of a sudden, you know, we might go and look for them and then they're no longer there. Um, the staff that we have up front, of course, they're just kind of there directing traffic, making sure that our clients are pretty much getting to where they need to get. However, there's no um, like one-on-one -on -one support there should the client need it. Um, along with being able to offer multiple services, um, you know, sometimes I feel like we may overwhelm the client when, especially when they're co-current and they need mental health services, they need to see a primary care doctor, um, they begin working, um, they're also required to attend support groups, uh, some of them need to see a psychiatrist, um, and then we have the clients that are that are poly substance using, and they don't feel that any of the other um, basically illicit drugs that they're using that they're a problem. So they, you know, figure I'm just here for opiate use, and that's pretty much all the help that I need. Um, so those are the two biggest issues: is just how do we really provide? Um, like I said, we have a lot of awesome services. However, the process of being able to provide it and, and bring it to the table to the client um, and just having them having to, to, you know, coordinate all the different services, you know, like I said, I think at times we're not um, really providing a, a, a good, I guess, transition from one to the next. And, and we're not sure exactly what we can do to really be able to help that client or those clients that need the multiple services. It's a really, um, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Along with that, um, you know, sometimes we get clients that are, we do have one detox center here in Corpus Christi. Um, and sometimes we do get clients that, want to come from there. However, they've already started detox services and then they're barely, you know, calling us to try to get um, into the, the MAT program or have that medication assisted treatment. Um, so that also has, we've noticed some challenges because we're not communicating up front. And by the time they have already reached out to us, the client has already been in detox for about two weeks. And if we can get them in right away, um, that also that's also sets another barrier um, to be able to provide them those transition services as they need them, or even the ones that are coming out of the emergency room. Well, thank you, Daisy, for that for that introduction, um, Lindsay. I'm coming to you, and this this question is actually while well, Lindsay's um, speaking up, a question for all of you. I kind of want to hear what your what your impressions, your feedback is for Daisy um, based on based on this presentation. Lindsay, let's start with you. Yeah, so you know, I will say that I think that this is a it sounds like a very like perfect time pretty much to, to pull in the the recovery specialist, right? Because, you know, I think organizations do really well when they put that that recovery specialist like almost as the face of their organization. So when somebody walks in, they can immediately connect with that person and they can like I know we actually can go with people to appointments and things like that and kind of spend that extra time with them to help walk them through each of those services that they might want um, and help explain it to them and, and you know, really make sure that they, they, you know, they have that really good informed consent that's so important and make sure that they feel comfortable. Thank you. And Daisy, did I hear you correctly that do you have a recovery coach on the team? As part we of the okay. we do, yes. All right, great. Well, uh, Aisha, yeah, go ahead. Hi, Daisy. This is Aisha, and I hear you. I've been in this position, and so much relatable stuff that you said because I've been an OBAT program coordinator as my previous uh, position. So I'm trying to understand, Daisy. You said you're the coordinator for the program, or you, did you coordinate like the substance use program? Yes, yes, just the, the project role. Okay, yes. so, sounds good. So it's pretty similar to what I was doing. 
And um, when you say that patients come in and then you go out and they're not there, right? So how we handle it here was that we didn't use the front desk. The patients were making direct contact with me. Even when the patients would come in, if it was just a walk-in, they would tell the front desk and the front desk would reach out to me. So I would immediately go and meet with them, right? And schedule an appointment or if someone was available, make sure that they're, they're being seen. The other thing that you said that at times you overwhelm the patients, oh God, that is again so, so relatable. We tell them we have this, we have this, you need this, you need that. And even for us, it's difficult, you know, because you want to give them everything, right? But then how we handle it again was just prioritize. At times I feel that their mental health is such a big issue for them that they forget that their physical health is being, you know, is at stake too. There's, they might have like high blood pressures or di they're diabetic or something, right? So maybe having someone involved in the team who has like a background in this and they can prioritize what is it that they need most immediately, right? Maybe go from there and that's how, that's how we will develop their plan of care. But I really think the main thing that probably you need to focus on is getting those patients in and not losing them, right? You know, when they're just in the waiting, waiting area and they can, can get to you. And like I said, normally up front, like we do try to do that. Like normally I have somebody like, let me know right away when somebody walks in right. and I do try to do that, that first engagement. Uh, but I think sometimes it's when they're already in the program mm -hmm. that we kind of lose them along the way because our, our team, basically we see them up front. Our recovery coach tries to see them once a week, but outside of that, when they come in for, for their medication, they're just coming in and they're just trying to be here and leave. And I think it's sometimes those moments when they do come in um, that again, they're under the influence, they've relapsed, something has happened along the way. And because we don't really offer that support at that point, because they're just here. And, and of course, the first person that sees them at that point is the LVN. But by that time, they've probably already been waiting in our waiting room for you know, 15, 20 minutes. And then they, they just get discouraged and then they leave. I agree. I think it's along the way that we sometimes lose them or right. don't really get to provide them that full support. It looks like, I mean, you do have everything, but maybe just a little structuring of your program might help. And I do work for an FQHC. I'd be more than happy to help with the way we managed it and how our program looked like. You can reach out to me anytime you want. And Aisha, okay. you all coordinate the, the visits with the medication um, right. and the prescriber with, with the other services. And so maybe trying to that sort of scheduling that. The scheduling, that's what I'm yes. saying. They probably what need is what they really need is a structure to the program, I would say. Right. I mean, they have everything, the, all the services. It just needs to be structured. Yeah. Thank you a question on that but Lindsay I want to hear from you a few things I think that one of the things that um helped us was to have we have a we work with CMS and we actually have one of our peer recovery coaches in their lobby so while that person is waiting just sitting there right we're having a peer coach talk to them and that's a really good way to have them connect with those people who are just sitting there anyway so they're probably going to want to talk to somebody or be willing to at least um and then the other thing that we that like I just always advocate for is really, you know, having, and I know that it's not possible for every organization, but letting them know that they are, you know, they, if something happens and if they return that chaotic use, that they're not in trouble, that they're okay to come, keep coming to you. They're okay to continue in your program, right? You know, that they, they can come back from that and not be ostracized because that's when we really lose people, I think, is when they are just on their own. So and like, yeah, and I, I, I do think that like if we could have our recovery coach out there, like I said, we offer so many services. There's a lot of people within the same building. So again, the front people, they're just kind of just guiding people, go here, go there. Um, but I guess if, if, you know, if we had somebody more up front that, that was providing that, that support, we, we might have better, I guess, outcomes. It's just a matter of buying and trying to figure out how we're going to, how we can, you know, accommodate that, I guess. Can I say that we also, you know, at one point before we were able to go into CMS, we had a peer that went out front with a pack of cigarettes because everybody smokes out front, right? I mean, they didn't actually smoke. They just went there with a pack of cigarettes to hang out with people. 
Thank you. We've got a, um, a question here from Sandra. And I think this is, it's looking at sort of the, the workflow or where the where clients are moving. So the question being, where do patients go when they leave the waiting room? And then also just a follow up, um, are there foods, food, snacks provided in the waiting room? No, um, they normally, they sometimes go outside. They, they are sometimes go to our restrooms and then, you know, we've had people use in our restrooms or we've had people, you know, we have a, a Dollar General right next door. So sometimes they'll just go out and go that way. Um, it's just, again, because like I said, because we're a primary care setting. So when they come in for their appointment, you know, sometimes they may not get seen right then and there, like an actual MAT treatment center where they come in, they get their medication, and they go here, they have to wait, they have to be seen by the doctor. Um, and of course, there's this, and because they're, they're a client just coming in for medication, so they get squeezed in between the appointments that we already have. Um, so again, we don't have anybody really engaging them out there. They do get antsy, um, you know, and if, if, if there's things going on in their life, sometimes they just, they just leave. But at that point, um, even though we try to encourage them, like, you know, let us know if you're here, let us know if you need to, you know, talk to one of us, let us know if, you know, you know, but again, it's, you know, sometimes those moments, they just, they just want to come in and they want to leave right away. Other impressions, questions for Daisy? It looks like there's another question. Oh, that's uh, from, oh, that's ah, from Matt. It's, it's from Matt. <laughs> hey, I'm happy to, to, to say that one though. This is this is getting to getting into the space of harm reduction. So is the full team aligned with the harm reduction approach? And I, I'd, I'd kind of like to hear too, Daisy, kind of your take on how how the team's been engaged about it, educated, and if you do think you have buy-in on, on a harm reduction approach. I, I definitely think we are not all aligned with that. Um, I know some of our, uh, well, the, the one doctor that we have, um, especially when it comes to polysubstance use, um, I know at first, you know, all they wanted to deal with was just the people coming in with opiate, like they just wanted to deal with the opiates, of course, somebody using any other substances, those substances really weren't being addressed. Um, and then when somebody starts our program, right away within two weeks, they're, the, you know, the our medical team, they start doing the UAs, um, and all of that, which um, in, in, I, only me and the LVN from our team have worked in an MAT program uh, outside of this primary setting. So normally in an in a MAT you know, treatment facility, we were doing UAs 30 days after they started treatment. Well, here we start two weeks um, and that also, so they, our, our, the clients only get three strikes. Basically you get three, you get strikes for not showing up to appointments or being a no-show. Uh, for having a positive UA, um, or, or of course, for not following like clinic, you know, rules and regulations. So right after the two week mark, they're already, you know, some of them are already starting to see what's called a strike. And that has also sometimes, you know, kind of scares them a little bit to say, oh, well, I'm not, you know, either I'm not going to make it or I'm not going to be able to, um, so I'm, I'm kind of working on trying to just extend that a little bit and, and just really, I guess having the doctors be more uh, mindful that, you know, there will be substances where they need a little bit more than two weeks um, just to be able to completely come off of them and be abstinence from everything. Because of course the medication that they're getting is only helping with opiates, it's not helping with anything else. I think that's a really good point. And it, it actually reminds me, Lindsay, of what you were saying earlier with that feeling people feeling ostracized and like they should leave and never come back. And certainly the language and terminology of strikes um, probably doesn't help with that. Um, but let's, you, you raise a lot of important questions and I think there's some expertise in this learning community. How have you engaged and trained up physicians to, to have um, more appreciation for issues like polysubstance use? <laughs> and maybe even the entire 
clinic community, the, right. you know, the staff and the, anybody affiliated, because if that language is the language, if it's like people are calling it dirty drug screen or, you know, helping realign the language, I wonder if, you know, if you add that to the question, Andrea. Are you talking to me? Oh, no, she's tagging on to my question. And I, oh, yeah, okay. I just thought I would tag on to your question because I, you know, just the providers will not direct, you know, the language typically and everybody interacts with them if they want to feel welcome. Yeah, all clinics uh, strategies for for better engagement, better communication in those conversations. So I'm just going to jump in here. Uh, one clinic we did all staff in the all staff meetings just asked for 15 minutes on just languaging and, and education around what you're doing, why you're doing, what the philosophy is, and just or just basic languaging. This is how we help our patients feel welcome. They're very different in the way that other patients might feel, but if we could all use the same language will get better results, but just maybe some all staff education, if you can get a little bit of time with everyone. Also the opportunity to, I think there's a good opportunity here, Daisy, to see if um, as a team, there could be some training and education done with that entire multidisciplinary group from a harm reduction approach, because MAT, medication assisted treatment, is in fact a harm reduction approach. So maybe some training and education from subject matter experts. Um, you can certainly tap into um, CSAT, maybe reach out to um, Dr. Lindsay, but there are um, trainings that are available that would probably benefit the entire team from understanding medication assisted treatment and how that comes from a harm reduction approach and then understanding that an opioid use disorder is a chronic illness and what does that mean and what does that entail so that there is um, a better understanding of this um, this illness because it sounds like um, the team would would benefit from some training and education. Everyone always benefits from that. So, you know, maybe that's something you you could explore or talk about as a team. Thank you. Yeah, and like I said, we're we're just a very small piece mm -hmm. of the our clinic setting. However, I feel we're a very important part of you know, of what we need for, especially for our clients. Um, and then, and, and especially for, um, you know, nowadays that we really can't afford for a client to relapse, especially with fentanyl out there. Um, so we're just really trying to, again, find ways. Um, but sometimes, you know, with, with the behavioral side of things to the medical side of things, you know, they're, I feel like sometimes they're already set on their ways. Like this is what is this is how we're gonna do things on the medical side of things, and this is just how it works. So we're we're doing changes, obviously, in the behavioral side, but definitely, I really think there should be more collaboration. But um, I think at times we're not, you know, again, the what I feel is that you know the primary focus here is primary care. Like that's that's what, and and we're just that small little piece that kind of got placed in here and and but again I mean we'll, we'll continue to work every day to get the buy-in to just really you know change things around just for the the um benefit of our of our clients overall and and I will say I'll get a tag on to what you just said primary care um well um understanding again doing some training on understanding um, a chronic illness such as opioid use disorder, it does fall under the umbrella of primary care, if, if you think about it. It's, it's so separated, which I think perpetuates the stigma, which is part of the problem. But you have an awesome vehicle here to incorporate all of that so that the patient is getting their 
diabetes taken care of, their high blood pressure, their opioid use disorder, their alcohol use disorder, their just all of that care under um, an FQHC, which, which is a, a great agency because usually with an FQHC, there are so many resources available. So... Right. And, and like I mentioned, yeah, definitely. I mean, we we do have a lot of services, but, you know, and, and, and we do have those clients that definitely can benefit from all of them. But, you know, and, and sometimes that's why we just kind of try to step back, really understand the client, really figure out what is your priority. Like, even though somebody has, let's say, a certain medical condition or the co-current mental health disorder, things like that. But sometimes to them, that's not important. Sometimes to them, it's like, no, I just want to focus on, you know, getting stable on this. And, and again, or I don't, you know, so we just really try to understand what, it, what are your needs? What are you going to pretty much commit to doing? Whether that's seeing the psychiatrist, if that's important to you, or going and getting general mental health, or, you know, getting that um, PCP appointment that you need, you know, things like that is, is kind of where we sometimes again, feel that, that that we can sometimes overwhelm them because we just, we're like, we have all of this. What would you like pretty much? And again, sometimes, you know, they, they do follow through and other times we just lose them along the way. Um, thanks, thanks Daisy for the, for the more of that context. Um, I don't want to miss that Lindsay up in the chat, you'd also mentioned you incentivize visits by providing harm reduction supplies like Narcan. So Daisy, that's just one more tip there. Um, but Lindsay, go ahead. I don't know if the incentivize is the right word, but we do provide that. So I think, you know, really where, like where people get lost is, is feeling like they're overwhelmed and like, it's just, they don't know what to do. You know, so I think having that, like, and again, I, we do it with peer support, right? That person that they can walk in the door and meet and connect with, because that sense of connection is what's going to keep them there, right? And then having that, like being able to build that rapport with somebody and then have that person stay with them as they walk through all of those services can be just incredibly helpful because then you, they have somebody that they can, you know, really rely on and help them feel comfortable and help them feel accepted and, you know, help them understand like all these different things. Um, and then also the, there's a really good training for medical provider providers done by UT is called um, the reset stigma and it's I can't think what it stands for right now um reducing stigma education tools and I put that link in the chat but it appears like that is down right now and Aaron before we come to wrap up I just a thought from you I saw something in the chat too no I was just saying um Leslie had put the, this, the piece about reset stigma that I think multiple folks are talking about in the chat, and even just this idea of a tip of the day, because I think this is one of those things where you're really moving towards a culture shift, and you have folks who are not necessarily on board with that. So this is one where kind of the, the continual drip approach is probably going to be more powerful than the one time let's slam it and for big change approach. So this idea of even finding kind of non-threatening, friendly, harm reduction kinds of ways to change provider perspectives as well, right? It's it's kind of a similar thing, um, can be really powerful. So I, I love that as a, as a practical small tip. So, hey, because if you can get that inserted into a regular meeting, that kind of thing can be really, really powerful. Okay, that's all. But this is such a treat. I really enjoyed getting to hear this conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, great feedback. Yeah, long-term change might not happen overnight, right? Well, we are racing to the end of the hour here. I want to stop for a moment and turn things over to our lead specialist for today. Matt, can you summarize some of the key points from our conversation? Absolutely. Thank you, Andrea. I appreciate the conversation. Appreciate uh, both uh, presentations. A um, couple of ideas. So uh, in terms of where we're trying to go, what Daisy's trying to do is to create this integrated culture, this multidisciplinary model, trying to ensure that best practices for medications for opioid use disorder are in place and to use a harm reduction orientation. So then if we consider some of the core elements that Aaron described, how can Daisy and others use some of those core 
uh, adaptation concepts to try to shift culture, as Aaron was just saying. How do we kind of look at look for that fit? How do you come think about the real world compatibility, as Aaron was describing it? How to think about that fidelity and fit balance that Aaron was describing? And could Daisy then kind of use some of these tools, the adapted or the or the MPACE or others, to kind of think about a sequence within that within her environment to be able to shift culture, uh, maybe gracefully, slowly across time to find that fit so that you can increase the level of fidelity to that evidence base, to that harm reduction model, to that integrated care model. So I think that's the orientation for us today, for all of us, and hopefully, Daisy, you'll be able to draw from this and work with your team toward that end. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. I want to thank you, Aaron, for the great didactics today. Daisy, for bringing us such a challenging case to talk about and learn from and to, to hopefully share some strategies that, that help you along the way. Um, this is not a one-time thing. Come back with more questions. Come back with um, those, those strategies when you identify them. And uh, thanks to our hub team. Most of all, thanks to all of you who keep showing up for these sessions and giving your feedback and your, your experiences um, into this space where we can learn together. Hope to see you at our next session, Thursday, June 22nd. Until then, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye, everyone.